I'm going to rank all 34 gaming laptops I've tested this year from best to worst using this tier list. The way it works is simple. There are seven tiers with F being the worst and S being the best. But what does S even mean? Isn't A the best, I hear you ask? Well, according to the famous historian Wikipedia, S stands for superb or super. I've got all the laptops on the right hand side in alphabetical order. I can only fit 15 at a time, but don't worry, all 34 are there. All of these gaming laptops want a piece of that S tier action, and there has been some serious competition this year. So let's find out which models make the cut and where everything else ends up. And if you are looking for a new gaming laptop, you can save the most amount of money with our gaminglaptop.deals website. We update it every day to share the best sales, so check it out regularly with the link below. Alright, just some quick important disclaimers before we get into the ranking. This video is not sponsored by anyone. All thoughts and opinions are a mixture of my own and my partner's, as she did most of the testing of these laptops this year. If I put anything in S tier, it doesn't mean that it's perfect. It just means that it doesn't have anything seriously wrong with it. Fact is, nothing in life is perfect. That's just the way it goes. There's trade-offs everywhere. And something that might be amazing for one person might be complete garbage for someone else, because you all have complete different requirements and use your laptops differently. So obviously, as a result, all of these rankings are going to be pretty biased towards my own thoughts and opinions. Though, where possible, I do try to let the objective test data do the talking to come to those conclusions. So if I rank something low, it doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't buy it. It just means that I think there might be a better option. And if I happen to say that your laptop sucks, just relax. These are just my opinions. They can't hurt you. All right, let's go. Again, we're working in alphabetical order. So up first is Aces Helios 18, and this has an RGB light bar on the front, so straight to S tier. I'm just joking, it's probably more like a C. Honestly, I think it's okay if you're after an 18 inch gaming laptop. For me personally, that's a bit too big, but it is one of the cheaper options out of the 18 inch laptops that we tested this year, at least compared to the Asus Scar 18 and Razer Blade 18, which cost way more money. And to be fair, I am willing to admit that games do look better on bigger 18 inch screens. For me personally, the portability trade off just isn't worth it. Plus, not to mention, Acer gaming laptops tend to have louder fan noise than others. The Helios 18 was one of the loudest we tested this year. This laptop also has a bit of wasted internal space inside. There's a section near the, one of the fans that just has nothing, and the area around the battery isn't well utilized. There's just a few cases where it looks like they could have had room for more cooling or more upgradability. So it's kind of like they just took the 16 inch model and stretched it out so you could have the 18 inch screen. Screen, which isn't bad or anything, I just don't think they're getting the most of the 18 inch size. So let's start with the middle of the road C tier. Alright, up next is Aces Helios Neo 16. Unfortunately we didn't get to test the Helios 16, just this Neo version which I think is a little thicker and heavier and a little cheaper. I think when I did the review I was saying that it might be worth going for the last gen Helios 300 with 3070 Ti, because the 3070 Ti is pretty similar to an RTX 4070, but that was back when this came out. and the prices have dropped quite a bit since then. We've actually had some pretty good deals on the Helios Neo 16 on the GamingLaptop.deals website. Again, link below. Personally, I think I like this more than the Helios 18, so based on that alone, I kind of need to either put it into B tier or put this into C and lower the Helios 18 down to D. What's the plural of Helios? Anyway, with the Helios 18, again, I don't think it's really worth it unless you want the bigger screen at a cheaper price, which I guess some people do, it's just not for me. I suppose there's no reason we can't just have both as C tier for now. We'll see how we go, but don't be too surprised if I bump the 18 down to D. Alright, up next we've got Aces Nitro 5, which is meant to be their more budget-friendly entry-level gaming laptop option. This is exactly the same as the Nitro 5 from last year. The only difference is they gave it the option of RTX 40 series GPUs, which equals more FPS in games. Unfortunately, we didn't get the newer Nitro V or Nitro 16s this year. And the only reason I got this Nitro 5 is because I imported it from the US and bought it with my own money. Back when I did the review, I think the best sale we saw on it was 950 US dollars. Now the best sale we've seen on it is 750 dollars, which is extremely competitive for a full powered 4050 laptop with a mock switch. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any more advanced features like Advanced Optimus. I mean, it is a budget gaming laptop, I get it, but 
yeah, $750 is extremely attractive for people that are looking for a budget option. And when I recently did my top three best budget gaming laptops of 2023 video, this was up there. So I think I'm gonna put it at least B tier overall. But I guess if we're talking strictly out of the budget options, it would probably be more like A tier. But overall, I think B sounds pretty solid for the Nitro. All right, next up is Alienware's X16. And this was the only Alienware laptop we were able to get our hands on this year. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the M18. I asked them at least five times and yeah, it just didn't happen. And unfortunately, it's way too expensive for me to just abide to review that one. So this is meant to be a thinner 16 inch gaming laptop. And to be fair, the performance was actually quite good given that it is one of the uh, thinner 16 inch laptops. And it's got plenty of RGB, RGB on the touchpad and on the rear light ring. So again, straight up to S tier. <laughs> but seriously, the RGB looks nice, but it's definitely a bit of a gimmick. Like. Why do I want RGB in my touchpad? Yeah, I guess it kind of looks cool, but like it doesn't do anything. And the RGB light ring on the back also looks kind of cool, but it can get so bright that you can't actually see the ports on the back when you're looking directly at it. Of course you can turn the brightness down, but again, it's just not really practical and you're never actually gonna see it when sitting in front of the laptop and using it. It's just the kind of thing that's for flexing on people walking by. They see that light ring and they know you've got an Alienware and then they know that you've got lots of money and you'll have to watch out. Unfortunately, being a thinner option, it has soldered memory, and I don't think that you can get it with more than 32 gigs. So if you wanted 64 gigs of RAM, you're out of luck with this model, and you can never upgrade it. It also had three different screen options, at least when I did the review, and all of them maxed out around 300 nits, which is the minimum I like to see. But from a premium brand like Alienware on such an expensive laptop, honestly, it's kind of embarrassing. That's just not bright enough for a high-end laptop, in my opinion. The software was also just broken out of the box. It took like two minutes to load up. We had to manually do an update and then it was perfectly fine and it took more like 20 seconds, which is much more reasonable. Still not quite as good as some others like Asus and Lenovo. And they do have pretty decent BIOS customization. So all things considered, I think this is gonna go into C tier. And that's mainly due to the higher price, no upgradability and the dim screen options. If they gave us like one memory stick upgradability and better screen options, then yeah, I would definitely pump it up to B. So yeah, not a bad laptop if you can afford it, but definitely some downsides to be aware of. All right, next up is the ASUS SCAR 17. So we actually had two versions of this. We had the first one with the AMD Ryzen 9 7945HX, which is their 16 core mobile processor. And then a few months later, we had it with the 7945HX 3D. So same thing, but with the 3D. And we all know 3D means better. So straight to S tier. <laughs> but seriously, it did perform a bit better compared to the SCAR 17 without the 3D. And that's just because you get uh, that extra V cache. And that helps in games, especially at lower setting levels or lower resolutions like 1080p. But of course, the 3D version does cost more money too. So only really worth it if you're super serious about getting the absolute best performance in games, like maybe esports titles. The SCAR 17 is otherwise the same chassis as last year. I think they might've added a camera on top, but that's about it. So it still has the design I don't like where when you take off the bottom panel, it's got the ribbon cables connecting the bottom panel to the motherboard for the RGB light bar on the front. So that's a bit annoying. Speaking as someone that's opened one of those laptops and completely forgotten about it and pulled the header straight off the motherboard, ruining the RGB forever. And well, no RGB equals F tier, obviously. So yeah, you don't want to do that. But the SCAR 17 is pretty much just a refresh of the SCAR 17 SE or special edition from last year, just with newer CPUs and GPUs. It also gave us one of the worst battery life results out of all laptops tested this year. But I guess that is to be expected when it's got a beastly 16 core CPU inside. So it's a trade-off between performance and battery life. There weren't any major problems with it, but the screen was around 300 nits. So kind of like the Alienware X16. Not ideal, especially for a more expensive premium laptop. So I think for this, we'll go with B for now. I'll put it ahead of the Alienware X16 because it does have more upgrade options and much more power. And it's also cheaper too, which isn't too hard when you're comparing something against Alienware. All right, next up, we've got the Asus SCAR 18. So unlike the SCAR 17, the 18 is a completely new redesign this year, which means that it has some nice improvements. And these include a third fan for cooling, which results in good thermals. The screen is actually quite good with their Nebula HDR panel, and they removed the ribbon cables, which means you can take off the bottom panel without worrying about destroying your RGB. But yeah, the RGB on this thing is kind of overkill. So straight to S tier. Is that joke ever gonna get old? 
I don't think so. Again, like the SCAR-17, battery life wasn't very good, which again, kind of expected from such a powerful overkill machine with top end specs. But performance while running on battery power was excellent. It is very expensive though, but it has had some decent sales, which we've had on the gaminglaptop.deals website. Though I think that might've been for the Strix G18 rather than this SCAR version, but they are quite similar. The differences aren't too big if I recall. I think this is gonna be our first A. The SCAR-18 is a very nice laptop. Again, I'm not personally a fan of 18 inch screens just cause the laptop gets a bit too big, but I can recognize a nice laptop when I see one. With the high price tag, I could see myself moving it down to B tier, but prices change all the time. So just speaking purely in terms of the laptop, I think A is reasonable. All right, next up is the Strix G16. And obviously that's got an RGB bar on the front, so straight to S tier. All right, you might think I'm joking, but I'm being completely serious. Not because of the RGB bar, but I think the Strix G16 is actually our first S tier laptop. It was definitely one of the best laptops that we tested all year. There just wasn't really anything to complain about, which is kind of all it takes to get to S tier, I suppose. It had nice features and it worked well. My main problem at the time of review was that it was just pretty expensive. And that still seems to be the case now. With a small sale at the moment, it's still 1700 US dollars. And that's for an RTX 4060. You could easily get a 4070 laptop elsewhere. So it seems like Asus are charging more money because they know what they've got, a good laptop. But yeah, if you can find it on a good deal, definitely worth considering because I reckon it's S tier. All right, next up, we've got the Asus TUF A15. So we only reviewed this a few weeks ago. Tried to get it earlier, but it just didn't happen. But hey, we got there eventually. Now, overall, I think this is a good laptop. It's basically the same as last year's TUF A15, except with updated CPU and GPU. And last year, I gave it an A. So given it's basically the same, and I think it is a good mid-range laptop overall, uh, at the moment, we're gonna start with A and see how we go. Now, the screen in the Australian model that I had was really garbage, and I don't recommend that to anyone. But it seems like that doesn't really exist in other markets like the US. So just check the screen specs before buying. If we are talking about the Australian screen model that I had, then yeah, I would probably put it down to C or D tier. But assuming you get the screen that seems to be available in most regions, yeah, A no problem. There's just not too much to complain about with the A15, except for perhaps the price, like the Strix G16. I don't know, sometimes it just seems like Asus could probably run some better sales. Although the tough A15 is Asus's budget option, it ends up costing quite a bit more compared to most of the other options out there. Though to be fair, it does also generally have more features, like Advanced Optimus and G-Sync, which aren't usually things that we see from a budget design. And I don't think it makes sense to put the A15 on the same level as the Nitro, so it can stay in A tier for now. Now, obviously I'm not saying that the A15 is equivalent to the SCAR 18, which is next to it in A tier. They're kind of different categories of laptops. The SCAR 18 is a big overpowered beast, while the A15 is a mid-range option, but they can both be A tier for different reasons. Otherwise, all the budget laptops would just be in E and F. Next up, we've got the Asus TUF A16, which is very similar, but it's got a larger 16 inch screen, which is 16 by 10. So a bit more viewable screen space compared to the A15. And it's also the only all AMD laptop that we tested all year. So it had Ryzen CPU, although I think it was a last gen Zen 3 processor, probably to cut costs, and the Radeon RX 7600S graphics, which performs about the same as an RTX 4050. We really wanted to get the A16 in the new Sandstorm finish because I think it looked kind of cool, but they sent us the black one, so straight to F. Obviously just joking, but it would have been cool to get something that's just not a black rectangle, which is probably what 30 of the laptops we tested this year were. It gets kind of boring after a while. Anyway, with the Radeon graphics, you're missing out on DLSS3 frame generation, but FSR3 frame generation is out now. It just depends on which games support which technology. Though I guess if you went for a laptop with a 4050, you could use both. While with the Radeon graphics and the A16, you only get the option of FSR. Now, when we initially reviewed the A16, my conclusion was basically, why did Asus bother making this with Radeon graphics? Because you could buy a last gen A15 with RTX 30 series GPU for less money and it performed very similarly. But the A16 has had some very good sales since that time. We've actually got it on the gaminglaptop.deals website for $7.99 at the moment. Of course, that might not actually be the case if you go and check it out now, because deals come and go every day. Which again, is why it's important for you to check it out regularly so you don't miss out on any deals. But yeah, considering we've had other budget friendly laptops that are quite good with RTX 4050s go for $750, 
$800 for the A16 isn't amazing, but it's not bad either. Not to mention the 7600S does have more VRAM compared to the 4050, 8 gigs versus 6 gigs. So yeah, I think I'll have to go A tier in line with the A15, because as mentioned, it is very similar. And I think it's decent if you find a good sale. All right, tough F15 is up next. So this is technically a 2022 model and the only laptop that didn't come out this year, but I reviewed it in 2023, so I'm counting it in this video. And I only bought it because it was one of the most popular gaming laptops on Amazon. And I wanted to find out what all the hype was about because it had over 2000 reviews with like a 4.5 star rating or something. And as it turns out, it's actually a bit of a ripoff. And honestly, I'm kind of thinking it's F tier. Best case E tier, but I think there's an argument for F. Hear me out. So when I reviewed this laptop, it was about 700 US dollars for the 11th gen uh, i5 11400H CPU, which is two generations old, and NVIDIA RTX 2050 graphics, which performs about the same as 3050 graphics. But the problem is you can get the 2050 graphics and something else like a HP Victus for $450 on sale. And I haven't seen any good sales on this tough. Not only that, but it seems like the price on Amazon has gone up. So it's closer to $800 now for a 2050. It's actually possible to spend less money on a better laptop with newer 4050 graphics, which will destroy it in games. So that kind of makes it a bit pointless, unless they lowered the price to like $500 or $450 to match the Victus. Yeah, there's basically just no way I can recommend that to anyone, so I think it's just got to be F tier. Now, to be fair to the 2023 Tough F15, which we didn't get to test this year, there have been some really good sales on the GamingLaptop.Deals website. We've had an RTX 4070 version for $999, which is very good. So yeah, if it was the 2023 model, it would probably be B tier, if not a and close to the tough A15, which is basically the same as the F15, just that the F15 uses an Intel processor instead of AMD. But yeah, for the specific ripoff configuration that we tested, uh, yeah, F tier. All right, G14 up next. I feel like we're a third through the video or something and we're still on a SUS. Too many gaming laptops start with the letter A apparently. Anyway, this is a nice and portable 14 inch laptop with nice build quality. It's not actually too different compared to last year's model, which I think is fair because last year's was quite good. The main difference is that they went back to Nvidia graphics this year instead of Radeon, which they used last year. Build quality is definitely nice. I'd say the Razer Blade 14 feels a little nicer, but of course that's subjective. The main changes compared to last year are of course newer CPU and newer GPU. And there's also a mini LED screen option, but we didn't get that in our review unit. Now the keyboard on this laptop can get quite hot. It's the hottest 14 inch laptop that we had. And I think we only had RTX 4060 graphics. So I can't imagine what it would be like if you had a higher tier 4080 or 4090 version. Although it does get hot, it was mostly around the middle area. So if you're playing a game and you've just got your hands on WASD, it's pretty cool. So it depends how much you need to go into the middle. For some reason, this year's version only has liquid metal on the CPU and not the GPU. Last year, it had liquid metal on both the CPU and GPU. So that could be part of the reason why the keyboard's warmer. If I had to guess, it might be the same reason that a lot of uh, Nvidia graphics don't have liquid metal by default, which is because uh, I think I've been told it's smaller die size. So the benefits of liquid metal just isn't as much. There was also a trend with 14 inch gaming laptops this year that ASUS seemed to have missed out on, and that's two RAM sticks. The Razer Blade 14 went from all memory soldered to two RAM sticks and MSI's new Stealth 14 has two sticks as well. The G14 does still have one memory slot, so there is a little room for upgradability, just not as much as those others. But yeah, all things considered, I think the G14 is a solid gaming laptop, especially if you can get it with a good sale. And again, we have had some pretty good sales on the GamingLaptop.Deals website. <laughs> Seriously, I know I've mentioned it quite a few times and it feels weird promoting it so much, but there are just so many good deals at the moment. It's hard not to mention it. But yeah, anyway, I think this is A tier. Just a good laptop if you want a more portable option. All right, up next we've got Asus's Zephyrus M16. Now in my mid-year top five laptop video, I actually put the M16 as number one. So best laptop I had tested up to that point. Now that was like halfway through the year and we've tested more than double the total laptops since that time. So I wouldn't say the M16 is the best anymore. However, I do think that it is still quite good. Easily A tier at minimum, but I think there's a solid argument for it going into S. So compared to last year's M16, this year's version has some solid upgrades, including a third fan, it removes soldered memory and gives you two memory slots, and that new mini LED screen looks nice. Of course, not to mention newer CPUs and GPUs. Of course, it's not the most powerful or best cooled laptop as it is on the thinner side. It's probably more competition for that X16 from Alienware in C tier. 
but the M16 has more upgradeability and now a better screen, though it doesn't have anywhere near as much RGB, so down to D tier. Nah, I think it belongs in S. Alright, next up is the Dell G16, so that's one that we reviewed more recently. So overall, I thought the Dell G16 was okay, but nothing really stood out making it great. Plus it's priced quite high, so unless you're getting it on sale, it's not really worth it. The laptop is kinda thick, and it just has a plastic design that looks a bit dated because of the grey colours. Of course that's personal preference, and definitely subjective. But something that's not subjective is the 330 watt massive power brick that comes with it. Seriously, I think ours had an RTX 4070, there's absolutely no reason that a 4070 laptop needs a 330 watt brick. No other ones we've had had that. I'm pretty sure this is just Dell cheaping out, because I think those 330 watt giant chargers are fairly cheap, and I can see why, obviously no one wants them, and maybe they just have an oversupply of them from other laptops that they need to get rid of. It just makes the overall package much less portable, as you have to carry around this huge heavy brick. Not only that, but the 13th gen HX processor was one of the lowest scoring results in Cinebench compared to others. So even though it's got this massive power brick, it's not using that power. Granted, performance while running on battery power was pretty good with the G16, but that's one of the few good parts about it. And like the Alienware X16, the software was absolute trash out of the box. If you tried to open it up, it would take a minute or two to open. Again, we had to manually update it, so Dell have fixed that, and their changelog even notes that the fix is specific to make it uh, open faster, but it's annoying that that's something you have to do out of the box. So yeah, not a great laptop, I think we're gonna go D for Dell. Water break. Okay, Gigabyte's Aura 17X is up next. Now, if you saw the recent video we did where I went through all 3000 plus laptops that you guys bought using our links below the videos this year, not a single person bought the Aura 17X, so I guess you guys didn't like it. But you know what, it's got that little RGB bar on the back, so S tier. Alright, but seriously, I think the Aura 17X has some nice improvements compared to last year's version. Last year, the maxed out RTX 3080 Ti maxed out at 130 watts. At least this year's version with the 4090 I had went all the way up to 175, no problem. And it's got an improved cooler with four fans and vapor chamber, so I guess that's why. Not only that, but the build quality and materials are metal now rather than plastic, so it just feels a bit nicer and more premium. Unfortunately, the screen wasn't great. The one I had was 300 nits, and the response time wasn't great. I would expect one of these top end models to have a screen overdrive mode to lower the response time, but it didn't appear to have that. And my main gripe is that the keyboard still doesn't light up all keys and secondary functions. Seriously, they redesigned most of the laptop and couldn't upgrade the keyboard? Come on. It's not too bad in terms of price though. The RTX 4080 version is 2200 US dollars at the moment, which is a little more expensive compared to other 4080s that we have on the deal site at the moment, but relative to full price 4080s that we've seen throughout the year, it's not too bad. But yeah, I think it could benefit from just a little more of a sale. I'd want to see that price a little lower. But yeah, overall, the Aura 17X was actually pretty good, so I think we're gonna go with at least B tier. And I could see it going to A tier if it had a better screen, and if they fix that keyboard problem. A nice sale wouldn't hurt either. But I guess we can't have everything in life. Gigabyte also have their G5, which is meant to be a more budget friendly option, and it is actually one of the cheapest laptops available. Now while cheaper does mean that there are obviously going to be some negatives, I didn't think that it was that terrible. Now my partner, who does most of the testing on these laptops, thought that this was the worst laptop of the year, so for her it's easy F tier. She said it just didn't feel good during day to day use, especially using the keyboard, and she didn't like the control center software either, but your mileage may vary with those things. Now this gaming laptop regularly goes on sale for 800 US dollars with the RTX 4060, which I think is the cheapest 4060 that we've ever seen. But the reason for that is that the 4060 maxes out at 75 watts. So when you compare it to full powered RTX 4050 laptops in games, they're often about the same despite the G5 having the 4060. So you'd think the 4060 would perform better than a 4050 just based on the names, but that's not the case with Gigabyte's G5. And the reason it doesn't have a higher GPU power limit is presumably just because it doesn't have enough cooling inside, because that's just a place where budget gaming laptops cut costs. Having more metal inside and more fans just brings up the price. But to be fair, compared to those 4050 options, the 4060 does get you 8 gigs of VRAM compared to the 6 in the 4050, so that is a positive with the G5, compared to those cheaper 4050 options. 
I mean, Aces Nitro 5 in B tier is often cheaper at $750 on sale. The Nitro also has better build quality, a better screen, a nicer keyboard, a muck switch, and better CPU performance. I think the G5 was only better in a few things like battery life, but again it also costs more too. So based on the Nitro beating it, there's no way I can recommend it over the Nitro. So there's no way it's going above C tier ever. Now, I know I mentioned earlier that my partner would put it in F tier. Personally, I think that's a little harsh. There's definitely an argument for it, but I just, comparing it to this tough F15, I don't think that makes sense because I can't see myself ever recommending last year's tough F15 for the reasons mentioned earlier. But I think there is a case for the Gigabyte G5 if you want the 4060 with the extra VRAM. It's not a strong case, but it exists, so I think I might compromise and go for E tier. Could possibly be D tier, but I don't think so. There's just a lot of corners that they needed to cut to get the price that low. Don't get me wrong, you can definitely get that laptop and play games well enough. Modern AAA games will run quite well at 1080p. Just don't expect wonders when it comes to things like the build quality. All right, let's reveal our next set of 15 laptops. Up next, we've got HP's Omen Transcend 16. So this is basically like the Omen 16, but it's meant to be a little thinner. I think its main competition would be laptops like Lenovo's Legion Slim 7, maybe Asus's Zephyrus M16 in S tier, and I suppose Alienware's X16, though the Alienware and Asus are probably a bit higher end, I think their GPUs go higher. Overall, I think the Transcend 16 is a pretty good laptop, but it's a bit too expensive for what you actually get. Of course, fortunately, this can change with sales, so again, check those links below. I said in the review of it that I would prefer Lenovo's Legion Slim 7i, again, because they have similar features, but the Legion was slightly better in some aspects and was usually a couple of hundred dollars less. It doesn't quite perform as well compared to other laptops with the same RTX 4070 graphics either, which I would say is due to it being a thinner design, but we have other thinner laptops with 4070s that have no problems running at full power. So while you would expect that to be a trade-off of having a thinner laptop, I don't know if it was necessary. I mean, we have the smaller 14-inch Razer Blade 14 that can run a 4070 at a higher power level than this 16-inch laptop. It doesn't really make sense to me. I suppose there's an argument that the Transcend 16 might have needed more metal inside for more cooling, which could have increased the weight, and maybe they didn't want to do that. I suppose you've always got the thicker Omen for that, or maybe they just didn't want to cannibalize the thicker Omen sales, I don't know. But yeah, basically unless this goes on sale, personally I'd get the cheaper Legion 7. It's also limited to just one M.2 slot, which I think is kind of embarrassing for a 16 inch laptop. There should be plenty of space for two. I don't think any other brand has that problem at 16 inches. So yeah, all things considered, I think I'll go with C. It's a solid okay, but nothing too special. All right, next up is HP's Victus 16, which is also from the same brand, but it's meant to be a cheaper, more budget-friendly option. So its competition would be the Asus Tough A15, I suppose, Aces Nitro 5, and Gigabyte's G5. So this is another 16-inch laptop that, like the Omen Transcend 16 just before it, only has one M.2 slot for some reason. Which again, I think is completely unacceptable in a 16-inch laptop. There should just be space. Especially considering when I reviewed the Victus 16 two years ago in 2021, it had two slots. So for some reason they downgraded it. I don't know, maybe that makes the price cheaper? Maybe the motherboard is simpler? I'm not sure. But yeah, kinda sucks to get an upgradeability downgrade. It also had the slowest Wi-Fi out of any laptop we've ever tested. And not just this year in 2023, I mean ever, in the last three years. Plus it just had difficulty connecting to our network. So yeah, garbage Wi-Fi by default, but you might be able to fix that by taking out the Wi-Fi card and putting a new one in. They also made the hinge quite stiff too, because with the original Victus, uh, the lid was very wobbly. They might have overcorrected a little bit, um, but overall I would say it is better. The only thing you've got to watch out for is when you open the lid, you've really got to put your hand on the base of the laptop, otherwise the whole thing just goes up. So I did that once without thinking about it, lifted up the lid, whole laptop went with it, and then the base slammed down on the table, and the force was enough that it actually turned off the laptop, it reset. So not something you want to do too often. We also had the garbage 60 hertz screen, but it seems like that might be a bit of an anomaly because most of them have the 144 hertz option, which should be a little better. So I can't judge it too much based on that because that is something you can select when ordering and the ordering page doesn't even have the 60 hertz one anymore. Uh, despite it being a 16 inch screen, it's also 16 by nine. Most 16 inch screens this year are taller 16 by 10, so more pixels 
which results in quite a big uh, thick chin below the screen. Not really an issue, just looks a bit dated, but I guess not too unexpected from what's meant to be a more budget friendly option. The RTX 4050 configuration that we tested is kind of a ripoff at full price at over a thousand dollars. Definitely don't recommend that, especially when you can get something like Acer's Nitro 5 for 750 and that has more features and in my opinion a nicer build quality. So based on that the Victus definitely isn't going above the Nitro. Uh, I think it's definitely better than Gigabyte's G5 so it's not going to be an E tier. I think D makes sense along with this Dell, but I could see it going higher if we're talking about the more budget friendly entry level RTX 2051, which again goes on sale for $450. That's honestly kind of crazy considering the 2050 performs about the same as a 3050. So if you've literally only got $450 to spend, that Victor 16 is easily the way to go. So for you in that case, it would be S tier because it's basically all you can get. But the RTX 4050 version and just considering all the other downsides, I think D makes sense. All right, moving over into Lenovo, starting with the Legion Pro 5i. Now, I think when I did that top five laptop video halfway through the year where the M16 was first, I think I had the Legion Pro 5i as second. And look, after testing everything else this year, I still think this is an excellent laptop. So I'm gonna put it up in S tier next to that M16. So we've got ranks one and two from that top five video up the top, which I think makes sense. The Legion Pro 5i is fairly similar to last year's uh, Legion 5 Pro. For some reason, they moved the number in Pro around. So I mix those up. I think this year's version is a little thicker and heavier though. But yeah, overall there wasn't really anything to complain about with this laptop. So it's a pretty low bar to get into S tier. You just don't have to have a serious problem. The main problem I had with this laptop was that when it first launched, the RTX 4050 was 1450 US dollars. A massive ripoff. But since that time, prices have gotten much better. And we've had RTX 4070 configurations on sale on the GamingLaptop.Deals website for much less than that. My only other complaint at the time was that the 4070 is pretty close in performance to the 3070 Ti, but that's more of an Nvidia issue rather than something Lenovo's done. And ultimately, the Legion Pro 5 isn't the only laptop that uses a 4070. Though, that said, I think if you do want to go up to the 4080, you have to go for the higher tier Legion Pro 7i, which is up next. So if the 5 is an S, I feel like by default this kind of has to be an S2 because it is better. Not to mention it does have that RGB bar on the front. So yeah, guaranteed S tier. Now, I didn't actually include the Pro 7 in that mid-year top 5 video. And the reason for that is because although it is a good laptop overall, I thought that the changes that they made to it compared to last year's version, I didn't like them. Basically, if you're not up to speed, uh, Lenovo took a lot of the nice features out of the Legion 7 from last year and didn't include them in the Legion Pro 7. And I speculated at the time that this was because Nvidia's RTX 40 series are so expensive that they needed to make cuts in order to make it competitive. Uh, I also found out shortly after that that the Legion 9 was coming in a few months, though I obviously couldn't share that because it was under embargo, though I did try to hint towards it in the review of the Legion Pro 7. But yeah, there were just a lot of cuts on this laptop compared to last year's version. So to me, it felt weird to, um, you know, incentivize that sort of behavior and put it in my top five. So it's not to say that this isn't a good laptop. It is a good laptop. It definitely could have been better if it still had all the features of last year's Legion 7, but I suppose at least we have those in the Legion 9 now. And unfortunately, we did not get the Legion 9 in time for this video. But we might have a review coming in December. Apparently it's currently in the mail and should be here soon. So yeah, overall Legion Pro 7 is a good laptop and with the RTX 4080 it has had some pretty good sales. Again on the GamingLaptop.Deals website. It's actually had so many good sales that it was the best selling laptop in 2023. At least out of the gaming laptops that you guys bought with those links below the video. So look, I didn't even promote the Legion Pro 7 in that mid-year top 5 video and my review was kind of negative because I was talking about all the things they removed. Yet loads of you still ended up buying it and are enjoying it. And yeah, it is a great gaming laptop. So S tier compared to other 2023 laptops. All right, up next we've got Lenovo's Legion Slim 5. So there are two Slim 5s. We've got the 14 inch with the OLED screen, which we're doing first, and then we'll do the 16 inch afterwards. This was my favorite 14 inch gaming laptop this year. And given we have the G14 in A tier, I kind of want to just put it in S tier. Personally, I think the build quality feels nicer. It's got two M.2 slots instead of one with the G14, and it has an OLED screen, and I really like OLED. 
I like the deep blacks and contrast, the colours and super fast response time. The reflective screen isn't for me, but I'm willing to deal with it for the rest. Unfortunately, unlike the G14, which has one stick of memory available and the rest soldered, the Slim 5 14 inch has all memory soldered, so it cannot be upgraded. So due to that alone, I feel like that kicks it out of S tier. Sorry buddy. But again, I do like it more than the G14, which is on the same tier. So I guess these are just at the same tier, but for kind of different reasons. Again, this is all personal preference. I'm sure some of you will be super against soldered memory and it's instant F tier. That's up to you. I really liked that the performance was basically the same as that biggest 16 inch version. Whether we're talking about gaming or just CPU performance, you're really not missing out getting the 14 inch version. It's just more portable, especially when the 16 inch version is still called a Slim 5. Honestly, I don't think they should have given it the slim name. It's basically a Legion 5 from last year, and the Legion 5 was a great laptop. If I recall, I gave it an S last year. But yeah, I don't know, it just feels a bit misleading to shove slim into the name for some reason, when it's not slim. It's still quite a thick laptop. So this has at least got to be an A for me, because as a mid-range laptop, I think it is a great option. Definitely in line with the Tough A15. The Tough is a little cheaper at the moment when on sale, while also having a higher tier CPU. But it does have a lower resolution 1080p screen. The 16 inch version isn't as portable as the 14 inch version of the Slim 5. Obviously, the size is different. And it's made of plastic compared to the metal 14 inch version. But the extra room gives the 16 inch version features like a numpad, upgradable memory, and a bigger screen. Granted, no OLED here. Guess there's no real reason that I can't put it into S tier, because I don't think there was anything super negative about that laptop. And like I said, it's basically a Legion 5 refresh, and I think that's been S tier for the last couple of years. Uh, it does feel a bit weird to shove so many Legions into S tier, and I did say I liked the Slim 5 14 inch more than it. So it also feels weird to put it above that. But the 14 inch is only there because it can't have upgradable RAM. Yeah, I don't know, that's a tough one. It's kind of similar to the Strix G16 in that both are excellent mid-range options. And I definitely have no problems recommending either of them. I think it could go either way, A or S. I think I'm gonna go with S just because I think it's better than the Tough and closer to the Strix G16 if we're talking about mid-range laptops specifically. Even though I do personally like the 14 inch more. And the 14 inch I like more than the G14. So I guess both could be S. Whatever, I'll leave the 14 and put the 16 here. But we could swap them around based on whatever you personally like. All right, up next we've got Lenovo's Legion Slim 7i. So this is basically a higher tier version of the Slim 5. I think the main competition for this is HP's Omen Transcend 16. And as mentioned earlier, the Legion is often cheaper and has some nicer features. So based on the Omen being C tier, this is at least gonna be a B. And like I mentioned before, other thinner 16 inch laptops like Alienware's X16 and Asus's Zephyrus M16 also exist, but those are more expensive with more powerful GPUs. So I think out of the more mid-range slimmer 16 inch laptops, the main competition is that Omen. Now this year's Slim 7i is a little thinner and lighter compared to last year's version, but it still has soldered memory. But I think last year's version was limited to 8 gigs of soldered memory with one stick for upgrades. This year's version can have up to 16 gigs soldered. So I think that's less of a problem in terms of upgradability, because you could get 16 gigs soldered then put a 16 gig stick in for 32 gig. So not ideal because you can't just put in two 32 gig sticks, but hey, it's better than what we had last year. So again, soldered memory, not some Something I want to promote, definitely not going to be S tier. And despite this being a thinner laptop, it still performed quite well compared to other laptops with the same GPU, which was the RTX 4070. Because all 4070s max out at 100 watts due to Nvidia's voltage limit anyway. But yeah, definitely performs better than the Omen. I might actually go with B tier, which might be a bit controversial because I know a lot of people like their Legion Slim 7. Personally, I like the Slim 5 14 inch more. Maybe if there was a 14 inch Slim 7, I might change my mind, but I just really like that portability and OLED screen. But yeah, I could easily see the Slim 7i going into A tier as well. It's a nice feeling laptop with some epic battery life for an Intel model. And of course, just because I've got the Slim 7 in B tier with the Nitro 5, doesn't mean I'm saying that I think those are equivalent. The Nitro is a B tier with regards to more budget-friendly, cheaper laptops. Whereas the Slim is a B compared to, I guess, more mid-range, thinner laptops that still have some power, if that makes any sense. 
Alright, next up is Lenovo's Lock 15 and 16, and although these are two separate laptops and we fully reviewed and tested both of them in the review, they're more or less the same laptop, it's just one has a 15 inch screen and one has a 16 inch screen, so slightly less bottom chin down the bottom of the screen and more pixels. Now. Again, I recently did my top three best budget gaming laptops of 2023 video, and I thought the lock was the best. So I thought it was ahead of the Nitro 5 in B tier, and ahead of the Tufts in A tier. Kind of interesting that I put the Tufts ahead of the Nitro here, but then I said the Tufts weren't worth it in the top three video. Yeah, I think the Tufts are better than the Nitro, just to be clear, but as I mentioned, the Tufts often cost too much money, and I guess in that budget laptop video, price was quite sensitive. Whereas here, I mean, I am factoring in price and how often things have sales, but I'm also trying to focus more on the actual laptops because price can change over time. But yeah, the Lock 15 and 16 uh, were very good for a budget-friendly gaming laptop. I think this has easily got to be S tier, as weird as it feels to have four legions in S tier. I mean, seriously, just think about this. This is meant to be a budget-friendly laptop, and the RTX 4050 version has gone on sale for $750, which is the same as Ace's Nitro 5. But in my opinion, the lock has nicer build quality and even features that way more expensive laptops don't have, like Advanced Optimus and even G-Sync. That's kind of ridiculous for a budget option. I mean, MSI's Titan GT77 doesn't have Advanced Optimus or G-Sync, and that's a $5,000 laptop. The Tough in A tier does have both of those, but in my opinion, the lock just feels nicer and it looks less gamery and more clean. But again, that is subjective and personal preference. And as mentioned, the lock is pretty much always cheaper, especially on sale. I don't know, some laptops like the Tough A16 seem to go on sale all the time, but then the A15, pretty rare. Maybe the A15 already sells well and they don't need to discount it, I don't know, but it would be nice if it had some better sales. Alright, speaking of MSI, up next we've got the GE68HX. So the biggest issue that I've got with MSI is none of their laptops are using Advanced Optimus this year, which seems like a huge oversight. I seriously have no idea why they didn't do it. Every other brand has introduced it. And as I mentioned, even that $750 Lock 15 and 16 have it. The GE68 is like three times the price. So yeah, kind of weird to have a more premium laptop like this and not include it. Plus again, there's no G-Sync. Again, even those lock laptops have that. Although I suppose that will depend on what screen you get in your region. But if I recall, all of them, or at least most of the options, had the option of G-Sync. Just check the spec sheet before buying, if that's important to you. But ultimately, like many other MSI laptops, as you'll see soon, it's just too expensive. This laptop with RTX 4070 graphics is $2,500 US dollars when on sale. That's just too expensive when you can get a Legion Pro 7 with an RTX 4080 for less money. And the 4080 is going to destroy the 4070 in games. That's just a fact. And you can also get similar performance and features for less money with something like the Asus Strix G16. Plus, just in my personal opinion, the RGB bar on the Strix is nicer than the MSI. But I just don't like the kind of pixelated look they went for on the MSI. Again, completely subjective. To be fair to MSI, their advanced BIOS is the best compared to pretty much any other brand. You can customize almost anything in there, and that goes for all of the MSI laptops we're about to cover. It's also one of the few laptops that has support for PCIe Gen 5 on one of the SSDs, so maybe that contributed to the increase in cost. But given Gen 5 SSDs aren't really available yet, I don't know how useful that is. I suppose you could argue it's good for upgradability in the future, but yeah, I guess we'll see. It's definitely not a terrible laptop, it's just not amazing, especially when overpriced and missing critical features like Advanced Optimus. So I'm gonna go middle of the road C tier. Next up is MSI's Stealth 14, which I believe is their first 14 inch gaming laptop. Now, compared to the Asus Sephiroth G14 and Slim 5 14 inch, well, I don't think it's quite as good as those. So let's stick it underneath in B tier for now and discuss. So the Stealth 14 is usually a little cheaper compared to those other two 14 inch laptops. And in my review, I mentioned that it was the cheapest 14 inch laptop. So I guess MSI isn't always the most expensive, but more on that in our next laptop. I think it makes sense that the Stealth 14 is cheaper than the Zephyrus and Slim. Personally, I think the build quality of those two in A tier is a bit nicer. I think the screens are a bit nicer, especially if you go OLED and the mini LED. And the two in A tier also use AMD Ryzen processors, which gives them better battery life compared to the Intel-based Stealth 14. The speakers on the Stealth were the best from any 14-inch laptop that I tested all year. But for some reason, the speakers are like underneath the keyboard at the front, so it's really easy for your hands to cover them, which I think is a bit 
bit silly in terms of design. I guess there was no space to have them on the side or at the back like the G14. When we first covered it, the 4060 version was $1300 on sale, but now it's down to $1100 and is actually pretty good, which is why we've got it on the gaminglaptop.dil's website. All right, up next is MSI's GF63. Now, this is the cheapest RTX 4050 laptop we've ever seen, but there's a reason for it. When this first came out, it was a thousand US dollars, and I was shouting from the rooftops how much of a ripoff that was. I'm guessing it was only a thousand dollars at launch because that's what Nvidia came out and said RTX 4050 laptops will start from at CES in January 2023. So I don't know what the deal is, but I'm guessing brands like ASUS, MSI, Lenovo, etc., might be limited by Nvidia, and maybe they're not able to sell them below a thousand dollars for some certain period of time. I'm not sure. I guess it's also possible that because Nvidia said that, it allowed MSI to try and get away with selling this thing for a thousand dollars, which is more or less what I paid for because I bought it pretty early, and I don't want to talk about that. Anyway, the point is, it's available now for like $650, and although I don't think it's a great gaming laptop, for the money it is quite attractive, which again is why we have this one listed on the gaminglaptop.deals website. Fact is, not everyone is rich and can afford all these nice laptops, so if you are stuck to a lower budget, I could understand going for this. Now, that said, my main problem with this at $650 is that for just $100 more, you can get so much more laptop, either with the Acer Nitro 5 or Lock 15 and 16 which I put in S tier. Of course $100 isn't nothing, but honestly for a machine that you're probably going to be using daily for years, I really think it's worth saving up for if you can. The 4050's power limit in the GF63 is limited to 45 watts because it doesn't have a very big cooler inside. So although it has 4050 graphics just like the Lock and Nitro, the Lock and Nitro perform much better in games. The screen also kind of sucks, the keyboard doesn't feel good, the plastic build has a bit of wobble if you push on it, but again, not too unexpected from a cheap laptop. And that said, it does run modern games at 1080p quite well. And look, if this is all you can spend, it's cheaper than that tough F15 with 2050 in F tier and will perform better. But at the same time, I think the Gigabyte G5 is better. I mean, it costs $150 more, but you get the RTX 4060 and I think the build quality is a little better. Again, my partner would disagree. She thinks the Gigabyte G5 is the worst piece of garbage ever, which I assume by default means that the GF63 must be slightly ahead in that aspect. And look, I could see it going E because I said it's better than the tough, but I feel like I just have to put it in F tier. Because as I mentioned, you can just get so much more laptop for not that much more money. About 10% more money. I honestly just think it's worth saving the extra. Again, if you've only got a $650 budget, then yeah, this is the best you can get. So in your case, hey, this is S tier. All right, up next is MSI's Titan GT77. So this is MSI's most powerful gaming laptop, and it's meant to be a desktop replacement machine. So it is quite big. The main problem I've got with the Titan is it's just way too expensive. The maxed out 4090 version goes for over 5,000 US dollars, which is literally double some of the other options. Like we've got a Lenovo Legion Pro 7i on the deal site with a 4090 for half that amount. Is the GT77 worth double? I'd argue no, but it depends what you're after. And despite the high price, again, like the other MSI laptops, it's missing premium features like Advanced Optimus and G-Sync, which those Lenovo lock budget laptops have. Come on, get it together. Not only that, but it seems like maybe due to an oversight, it has a 720p camera. Even the lower tier GE68 HX has a 1080p camera. So I don't know if they just forgot to bump that up in the upgrade or what the deal was. Now, MSI market this as a thinner laptop. And look, considering what's inside, it's not what I would call thick, but it's nowhere near thin either. The width and depth are also quite big in order to fit everything that it's got inside. So although they might not have gone up, they definitely expanded in the other directions. And I mean, that allows them to fit a cooler that has four fans in it. So it can get quite loud if you max the fans out. And again, it has MSI's unlocked BIOS, so great for customization and people that wanna tune their laptop. I can only really recommend this laptop to enthusiasts. People that are gonna sit there going through the BIOS, customizing absolutely everything to get the most out of it. Because by default, I don't think it's tuned that well. I mean, in Cinebench multi-core performance, for example, even that MSI GE68 outperforms it. And I don't know, you would kind of just assume that the Titan would do better out of the box, right? Look, I think the Titan's fine, but it's just way too expensive. Unless you're someone that really needs the upgrade space, because it's the only laptop we tested this year with four slots for memory and three M.2 SSDs, it's just not worth it. You're really paying more for the upgradability and customization. If you care about that and you made money, then hey, this is S tier for you. I can't really decide. Uh, it's definitely not great, not bad. So I think I'll go with middle of the road C tier for now. 
All right, next up is MSI's GP68. Although the GT77 and GE68 in C tier are too expensive in my opinion, the GP68 kind of flips things around. So this is actually the cheapest gaming laptop with an RTX 4080 I've ever seen. The lowest price we've had on the gaminglaptop.deals website was $1,599. That's honestly kind of crazy. I think the next closest 4080 laptop we've had was $1,800. So that's a significant saving. So you can get RTX 4080 performance for $100 of dollars less. Some of those more premium 4070 laptops like the Zephyrus M16 in S tier will get beaten in games by this cheaper GP68. But the reason for that is there are other compromises with the GP68 that you need to know about. Overall I think it is a nice mid-range gaming laptop. The main problem I've got with it is the screen. So you can get it with a 1440p screen that I think is decent in terms of color gamut, brightness, and response time, but this cheap one is a 1080p 1440p screen. Well, full HD+, 1920 by 1200, which I guess makes sense because the screen is one of the first places that gets cut when a brand wants to lower the price of their laptop. And yeah, the screen just kind of sucks. It's barely bright enough, the response time is slow, the colors don't look great, and at 1080p, the RTX 4080 just feels a little wasted. I mean, the 4080 can run 4K games. Granted, maybe with a little upscaling help in there, but 1440p, no problem for sure, even at higher settings in modern AAA games. It also uses an older Intel 12th gen processor, which again, I suppose is to cut costs, but I don't have a problem with that, because the performance difference in games between 12th and 13th gen isn't really that big. So I think that's a smart choice on MSI's part. And just like the higher GE and GT series from MSI, no advanced Optimus or G-Sync. Initially I assumed that was some kind of cost cutting feature, but then I remembered those more expensive models don't have it either, so probably not. It was also really hard to open up to get inside and upgrade, because the plastic around the front of the laptop kind of just goes up around it, and yeah, it was just a pain. I wouldn't want to do that again. There was also a bug where if you run a game, the fans would max out regardless of performance mode. So even if you have it in the lower silent or balanced modes, the fans are just full blast the whole time. Uh, fortunately, it does look like this has been fixed. So in the latest BIOS from late October, according to the change log, it looks like uh, they have addressed that. But unfortunately, we don't have the laptop anymore to confirm that. So look, if you're using this laptop with its laptop screen, I could consider it being a D, but I'd probably at least go for a C, because I think the high performance is worth the trade-off. And look, the screen isn't super terrible, it's just nowhere near as good as what I feel a laptop with this level of performance should have. Personally, I'd be willing to spend $100 more to get it with a better screen, but I haven't seen that option available. Maybe it's only with the 13th gen options, which cost way more money, I'm not sure. But yeah, if this is $15.99, I'd pay $16.99 to get it with a 1440p better quality screen. But I also have to acknowledge that MSI might be making this laptop for people that don't care about the screen. Think of those that get home with their laptop and they dock and connect it to a bigger 32 inch high quality gaming monitor that they have. In that case, the GP68 makes perfect sense because you can save money getting a cheap full powered 4080 laptop and not miss out on any performance. And then you're not wasting your budget on a screen which you might not be using. So look, if that's your goal, I could easily see this going A tier, but I don't know if that's the majority of people buying a gaming laptop. So I think I might compromise and go for B tier. But again, easily A tier if you're using an external screen, or if you don't care so much what the quality of the screen looks like. The price on this thing just can't be beaten. I think at the moment when I'm recording this video, it went back up to like $1,850, but like every second day it goes back down to $1,599. Again, you'll just have to check the gaminglaptop.deals website so you don't miss any of those deals. All right, next up is MSI's Vector GP77. So this is in the same GP series as the GP68 we just went through. And the GP is MSI's more mid-range option that still gives you basically full performance in games. You're getting all those core features like uh, full GPU power, good CPU performance, and a MUX switch. But again, no advanced Optimus or G-Sync as is the case with all MSI. With the GP77 though, there wasn't really any anything remarkable about this laptop. Like my conclusion is basically, yes, it is a laptop. It's not bad, but it's not amazing either. So based on that, I'm kind of leaning towards C, just middle of the tier default. But it also had one of the worst battery life results out of any laptop this year. And it's also kind of expensive. Right now it's like 2000 US dollars for the RTX 4070. And a good 4070 laptop can be picked up for $1400, even 1300 with an average sale, even as low as a thousand with a more mid-range option. So when you can get better models for more than $500 less, it's not great. It's kind of weird how MSI do this actually. Out of all their laptops we've reviewed this year, they're either very expensive or very cheap. They don't really seem to 
to do the middle very well. I don't know, hopefully that's something they improve next year. Although I was originally thinking C, based on those other things I just mentioned, I think we're gonna go for D tier. Again, it's just not a remarkable laptop. Definitely fine for playing games on, just nothing special. And I don't think it deserves the same rank as the Helios Neo 16 or the GE 68, so D tier it is. All right, up next we've got Razer's Blade 14. But don't panic, we still have some more laptops to come. So this is a nice feeling 14 inch laptop. The all metal design does feel nice, but problems I've had with the blades is it seems like the black metal is just easier to chip. So although it feels like a solid laptop, I would be kind of nervous just chucking it in my bag and getting on with my day. I just feel like I'd have to be overly careful with it to keep it in good condition. Maybe that's not the case and I haven't used one long term. So I could be wrong there. Now I like this better than MSI's Stealth 14. But to be fair, the Blade 14 is also way more expensive. And it's more expensive than the Asus Sephiroth G14 and Lenovo Slim 5 14 inch in A tier. I kind of want to put it between A and B just based on where those other 14 inch options are, but that doesn't really exist. My Blade 14 and Stealth 14 both had 4070 graphics, but the Blade 14 was able to run them at full power and perform the same as bigger laptops, whereas the Stealth wasn't quite as good. So I think the Blade can really show what's capable in a thinner laptop. Of course, the combination of more power in thinner design does equal higher price. That's just the way tech has always worked. I think I'm gonna go with B tier. Personally, I would prefer the other 14 inch laptops in A tier. And although I think it's better than the Stealth 14, they're kind of two different ends of the spectrum. Like the Blade 14 is the most expensive 14 inch while the Stealth 14 is the cheapest 14 inch. So there are trade-offs with both depending on which way you go. I guess maybe because I, it's better than the Stealth, we could put the Stealth 14 down to C. No, I don't think so. I think MSI did a pretty good job with with their first 14 inch gaming laptop. So I'll leave that in B. All right, next is Razer's Blade 16. We had this with RTX 4090 graphics, but I think due to the slimmer design, it often didn't end up performing any better than 4080 laptops, which also cost way less money. I think once you get up to high resolutions like 4K, the 4090 can take over, but yeah, at lower resolutions, it often wasn't that much better than the cheaper 4080. Compared to last year's Blade 15, the 16 does feel heavier, thicker, more chunky, but the Blade 15 was also refreshed this year with RTX 40 series graphics. So you could look at that if you don't need quite as much power and you want a thinner, more portable design. Unfortunately, we didn't get this year's Blade 15 though. Uh, battery life was pretty impressive from an Intel machine at least. And CPU performance was quite good compared to the larger Blade 18 that we'll cover next. And the mini LED screen looks great. Personally, I really like that there's almost no screen chin. It looks like you're just getting all viewable screen space. The keyboard wasn't my favorite in terms of typing, which goes for all Razer laptops, but compared to other brands, the RGB lighting is definitely more even and brighter compared to the competition. So if you want a good looking keyboard, Razer seems to be the way to go. But personally, I'd prefer typing on something like an Asus or Lenovo keyboard, but personal preference, of course. I suppose this is competing with the Alienware X16, which I've got in C tier. They're both thinner, more expensive, more premium uh, 16 inch gaming laptops with higher specs. I think I'm gonna go with C because I prefer the more portable 14 inch model. I think this is just a bit too chunky for me. But again, the 15 inch version does exist for those that want it. The Blade 16 just feels like you're carrying this big slab of metal, which I mean, is essentially what it is, but it's just like not very comfortable. And that goes double for the bigger Blade 18, which is up next. Oh, and not to mention the RTX 4090 config of the Blade 16 is like $1,500 more compared to other laptops that are gonna perform similar. Well, if not even better, because as mentioned, the Blade's 4090 can get beaten by a 4080. So I think C is all right. Plus C tier is green and so is Razer, so matching. Anyway, over to the Blade 18. Performance on this one is pretty good in games. So it's better than the smaller Blade 16, I guess because they've got more space to boost those power limits, more cooling. But yeah, I said the Blade 16 feels like you're just carrying a solid slab of metal and the Blade 18 is even worse. It's just giant. Again, like I said earlier, 18 inch models aren't really for me. And I think this isn't as good as the Scar 18 in A tier. I think the Helios 18 in C tier isn't as good as the Blade 18, obviously. I think the Blade is like double the price. So based on that, I'm kind of leaning towards B tier if it's better than the 18 inch laptop we've got in C tier. I can't really recommend it unless you're made of money and you really want that all black metal design. Apart from the snake logo on the lid and I guess the RGB keyboard, which you can change, it doesn't really scream gaming laptop. You know, there's no light bar on the front, doesn't have an edgy design. I don't know, I could go C tier because 
I pr would personally prefer the more portable 14 inch version, but I think I'll go B tier for those reasons just mentioned. And it is better than the Blade 16 in terms of performance. And as an 18 inch model, it's ahead of the Helios 18. And hey, B for Blade. I don't know, it's not my favorite laptop. I could go C, B or C, either way. Pick your poison. All right, up next is XMG's Neo 16, which is also the Electronics Mech 16 GP in the US. So exact same laptop, just sold by different companies in different countries. And this is the only laptop we tested this year that has water cooling support. So basically it works by buying a little box, which is a water cooler, and you plug it into the back of the laptop. And in theory, it should give you better performance, better temps, less fan noise. Now, we actually found that the performance wasn't that much better. It was improved, but compared to the last year's Neo 15, uh, the performance improvement was bigger there with the liquid cooler. Now the liquid cooler does still result in the fans not running quite as loud, but I think it's still a bit louder compared to last gen. Additionally, even with the liquid cooler attached, the CPU performance is beaten by Razer's Blade 16, which is a thinner 16 inch laptop. So based on that, it kind of makes it sound like the liquid cooling isn't doing much. The main issue, if you could call it that, I don't actually know if it's an issue, it was done intentionally, I know that for a fact, is that the loop where the water goes through goes directly over the GPU, so it doesn't go over the CPU. Last gen it went over both the CPU and GPU. I think the reason for that is they just wanted to keep that 4090 cool, which hey, might be more important in games, but when it comes to CPU work, it seems like the CPU kind of misses out on that liquid cooling. I mean, it is water cooled, so there is always the risk of it leaking. I definitely had some leaks in my testing, though I am happy to admit that that could just be because I didn't have the connection on properly. It connects with with magnets and you've really got to make sure it's in the right spot. And another time I moved it while it was running, which obviously dumb idea. But the fact is you're mixing water with electronics, so you've got to be careful. And it's probably a risk a lot of you don't really need to make unless you're going to be in there tuning it to get the best performance possible. Uh, otherwise, as for the laptop itself, <laughs> there's more to it than just the water cooling. The battery life was pretty poor, the screen wobbles quite a lot, which annoyed us, and the screen doesn't have an overdrive mode, so the response time isn't as great compared to other laptops it's competing with. It's definitely a unique laptop, but I don't think it's for everyone. For me personally, I'm going to put it in D tier, which might be controversial. Look, if you're an enthusiast and you really care about the water cooling and all that, sure, B tier, maybe even A tier. There's no way I can go S tier just because of other things like the wobbly screen and build quality things, that type of stuff. But yeah, the liquid cooler also just wasn't impressive compared to last year. Even though the liquid cooler is redesigned and it, the liquid cooler itself is better, the end results you get with the laptop just don't seem as impressive compared to what we had with the older Neo 15. All right, so those are my laptop rankings for 2023. Of course, feel free to disagree with me down in the comments, but just know that if you do, then you're wrong. Obviously I'm joking, but if you would have done something different, then let me know. There were more than a few instances where I could have moved things around. If you want more details on any of these 34 laptops, then I've got links to full reviews linked below, as well as links to updated prices for all models. Plus of course, we've got that gaminglaptop.deals website where we'll post sales if any of these have a good deal. If you're still not sure which of these laptops is right for you, then check out this video next, where I've analyzed which gaming laptops everyone watching this channel bought in 2023. I'm not saying that you should just follow the herd, but generally speaking, the most commonly bought laptops are quite good. So I'll see you in that one next.